in this episode of Good Intentions, the original oh, NES nostalgia. I got it working! My dad taught me about these. It is Wild Gunman. When Marty McFly traveled with Doc Brown in a flying nuclear DeLorean 30 years into the future to October 21st, 2015, he stumbled across a couple of kids playing Wild Gunman in a retro 80s cafe. While the kids scorned the game for forcing them to use their hands, obvious Xbox Connect plants, Marty seemed excited by the sight of the classic Nintendo shooter. Marty's temporal origin point of October 25th, 1985 meant that to his point of view, Wild Gunman had only been released in the US a few days prior. The NES's initial US launch was exactly one week before Marty's precipitous departure from Hill Valley under threat of death by terrorist. What few games magazines existed didn't report on the NES until months later, and the system's debut made few headlines. The NES's initial launch in October 1985 happened at just a handful of retailers, specifically located in New York City, with the national rollout happening in mid-1986. Wild Gunman would eventually appear in a PlayChoice 10 arcade cabinet, but that system didn't debut until 1986 as well. And while Nintendo's Versus system had been present in American arcades since early 1984, Wild Gunman was never distributed in that format, despite what you might have seen at the 80s cafe. So, Marty either followed game news closely, possibly by BBSs, or else he was even cannier than that and actually had access to an imported Famicom prior to the NES launch. In any case, you have to respect the guy's commitment to nerdiness. He was way ahead of the curve. But while Wild Gunman was a cool new concept in video games for Americans when it debuted on NES, it was a fun blast from the past for Japanese gamers. Duck Hunt would be the light gun pack-in for the American console, but Wild Gunman marked Nintendo's first foray into Famicom light gun games back east. Wild Gunman had heritage among Japanese game enthusiasts, and its arrival on Famicom definitely drew a through line connecting the console to Nintendo's long history as a toy maker. It made a clear statement that Famicom was simply the latest iteration in Nintendo's legacy of innovative electronic toys. The game itself is ridiculously simple. It was barely enough to qualify as a standalone piece of software in 1985, and these days it feels more like the sort of thing that would be nothing more than a minigame within a much larger collection of games. In fact, that's exactly true, since Wild Gunman appears as a micro game in the WarioWare series. Of course, at the time, Wild Gunman had to stand alone as its own game, because the system's limited cartridges couldn't have handled anything more. Unlike most other NES launch titles, Wild Gunman featured big, detailed graphics drawn in Nintendo's 80s house style, which was patterned after Shigeru Miyamoto's art, if not actually drawn by him. Where sprites and other games tended to be extremely small, the characters in Wild Gunman were nearly one-third the height of the screen. They would march onto the screen, change direction, and flop comically to the ground when shot. Players can choose from three different play modes in Wild Gunman. Mode A is a one-on-one -on -one showdown in which a rival marches onto the screen, takes position, and shouts, FIRE! Literally shouts, in fact. Wild Gunman is the first NES game we've seen to take full advantage of the system's fourth audio channel, which allowed for digital sampling. No doubt the brief, scratchy voice clip that plays during each face-off also consumed a ton of cartridge space. You have a split second after an opponent's eyes flash to gun him down, or else he'll shoot instead and knock a life off your total. There are five different opponents altogether, though little besides their appearances distinguish them. Well, that's not entirely true. Each opponent has a semi-randomized reaction time to beat, measured in hundredths of a second, which is given in the upper portion of the screen as they emerge onto the stage. If you don't take aim and fire within this fraction of a second, you lose. While enemy times vary, certain characters tend toward opposite ends of the time scale. The timid, lanky gunman and the bolo-wearing rancher tend to offer the most time, sometimes as much as a second and a half. On the other hand, the guy in the brown leather vest tends to have the fastest reactions, sometimes as little as four tenths of a second. Assuming you manage to beat these times, you're given bonus points based on every tenth of a second by which you outshoot your opponent. This is added to the base reward you earn for bringing in these deadly desperados. As you advance, rival gunmen tend to give you less time to fire but offer larger rewards. There's no end game to wild gunmen besides running out of lives, either from being too slow on the draw or firing before being told to shoot. For those who master the A game, Wild Gunman also offers a B mode in which players face off against two gunmen at a time. This is a much more difficult prospect since you can't simply hold an opponent in your sights and fire as soon as he gives the word. Some opponents don't even draw on you, which means you can't shoot them. B 
B-mode requires faster reflexes and precise aiming, making it sort of the expert mode. However, the real fun comes in the third mode, in which gunmen pop up at random in the doors and windows of a building. In this mode, you don't need to wait to be given permission to shoot. As soon as you see a bad guy, you can unload into him. While it's a bit more forgiving in that sense, it also brings its own distinct challenges. In this case, limited ammunition. Still, that's about all there is to the game. It's fun and colorful, but you can see the entirety of the game in about five minutes. Each opponent you face represents a different Old West stereotype, from a bolo-wearing rancher to a leather-clad outlaw to the somewhat unfortunate bandito in his serape and sombrero. It's hard to be too offended by the more questionable character designs given the general silliness of the game. At worst, Wild Gunman offers innocent, light-hearted fun that happens to hail from a less sensitive time and a country whose only exposure to the Old West came from American Western films. Still, it's tough to imagine Nintendo making a game exactly like Wild Gunman these days, since the action consists entirely of players gunning down human characters. But again, its roots lay in Nintendo's product line from the 1970s, where they produced far more risque material than a shooting gallery consisting of cartoonish Old West stereotypes. The original Wild Gunman appeared in 1974, exactly a decade before the Famicom version made its debut. Nintendo produced it as an arcade machine, but it wasn't a video game. Rather, it was an electromechanical game based around a projector system that used dynamic film loops to present players with a standoff in which they dueled with live-action cowboys. Based on the speed and accuracy of the player's reflexes, the projector would switch to register either a successful hit or the enemy firing. Game over. According to Florent Chorgege's book, The History of Nintendo, Wild Gunman was created, naturally, by Gunpei Yokoi and demonstrated the company's enduring ability to respond to financial challenges, both internal and external. Wild Gunman was part of a line of compact, projection-based shooting amusements that President Hiroshi Yamauchi commissioned to pull Nintendo out of its massive debt brought on by a failed gamble. Back in 1973, Nintendo had introduced an elaborate, large-scale target shooting installation called the Laser Clay Shooting System, meant to take advantage of the empty space left in the wake of Japan's collective abandonment of bowling. Bowling had been a huge phenomenon in Japan in the 60s, but interest tapered quickly in favor of new amusements like karaoke early in the 1970s. Japanese popular culture tends to be extremely faddish and trend-driven. What are all these people lining up for? What could it be? A concert? You two in town? A new consumer gadget? Hang on, let's have a look. Krispy Kremes? And how long do you have to wait? One hour and 40 minutes. And that was certainly the case with bowling. It went from massive hit to uncool drudge almost overnight. All those expensive bowling alleys that popped up to take advantage of the trend couldn't be repurposed quite as quickly. And Nintendo saw an opportunity there to create new forms of entertainment and otherwise disused spaces. The laser clay shooting system looked to be a huge success, with orders coming in from all across the country. But then disaster struck. The oil crisis. The OPEC nations decided as one to raise prices of crude oil exports, which caused a global recession. Japan, which depended almost entirely on imported oil, was hit particularly hard, and pricey diversions like indoor target shooting suddenly held little interest. Laser clay orders were cancelled in droves, and Nintendo lost a ridiculous amount of money, having taken a gamble on an innovative new installation product and an impossibly terrible time. Nintendo reworked the technology into a smaller, less expensive product called Mini Laser Clay, which also failed to sell in suitable numbers. In desperation, Mini Laser Clay was reworked one final time to become Wild Gunman, which allowed players to place themselves into the role of a gunslinger in the climactic shootout of a spaghetti western. Unlike the bowling lane-sized laser clay shooting system, Wild Gunman shipped in a machine whose physical footprint wasn't much larger than that of a deluxe pinball cabinet, making it far more economical than their first venture. The game proved to be a respectable hit, and Nintendo soon produced other similar products to help dig the company out of the money pit the oil crisis had stranded them in. Some of these became future NES games, while others, such as Fascination, which involved shooting clothes off a woman until she was left nude, never made it outside of Nintendo's offices. In effect, the Laser Clay Shooting System and Wild Gunman were adaptations of existing Nintendo products, the Kosenju SP series. Introduced back in 1971, the Kosenju SP series had been a light-based target shooting system that allowed players to target interactive toys. While they were immobile and didn't fire back at players the way Wild Gunman's projected gunslingers did, a Kosenju custom figure would trigger off some sort of electromechanical reaction when shot. Initially, these responses consisted of lights or sounds, but the final two Kosenju toys, 1976's Custom Gunman and Custom Lion, were much more elaborate affairs consisting of plastic figurines that would collapse into a heap if hit in their target sensors. 
The Kosenju toys were also interesting for the key role they played in Gunpei Yokoi's design career. After the success of the initial line, Nintendo produced the advanced Kosenju Custom series, which offered much more advanced devices. The custom gun was rated for pinpoint accuracy at 100 meters versus the standard models 4 to 5 meters. While impressive, this turned out to be utterly inane as a product. According to Georges, Japan's cramped urban spaces meant finding a clear 100 meter space in which to play became practically impossible. And in any case, the small targets became vanishingly tiny at that distance. Plus, more to the point, the custom series cost twice as much as the basic Kosenju SP model. With a prohibitive price and impractical design, the Kosenju custom line proved an absolute disaster, selling about 5% of Nintendo's initial projections. But the difficult lesson it offered helped inform Yokoi's subsequent work. His toys and other consumer products afterwards were forever budget conscious and designed with an eye for the realities of play. That's why, for example, Game Boy had a crummy screen and an energy efficient processor, rather than trying to compete with Atari's Lynx with a ravenous 16-bit chip and backlit color screen. It's easy to forget just how wedded Nintendo's early game consoles were to its toy-making heritage, but Wild Gunman was right there in the thick of things. That connection was particularly clear for Japanese consumers. Unlike the sci-fi zapper Americans received as the NES light gun, the Japanese Famicom light gun took the form of a plastic revolver, a six-shooter designed to complement the Old West aesthetic of Wild Gunman. Not only that, but the Famicom gun shipped separately from the console in a package whose coloring, artwork, and typography bore a strong resemblance to the Kosenju custom gunman set and the standalone gun from 10 years prior. The message it sent was clear. The Famicom was a video game console, but some of the games it offered would be the latest iterations of classic arcade installations. The console was more of an evolution of Nintendo's products than it was a radical reinvention. Still, I doubt Marty McFly knew any of that, even if he was enough of a Super Nintendo geek or import enthusiast to be aware of and a crack shot at Wild Gunman a week after the game's limited US debut. Next on Good Nintendions, the game that sold Americans on the NES. Or at least sold Nintendo on America. <laughs> 